All right, scholars, today we're going to move on from the executive branch and start looking at the judicial branch in Article 3. All right, while we are watching this video lecture, you should be taking notes. We're going to talk about the structure of the federal courts, kind of how things move up in the courts, um, different types of jurisdiction. And what's really important here is that you have this vocabulary in front of you. And instead of having to go through the internet or your textbook um, to look up all these words, many of these are going to be defined here in this presentation. So make sure you have this out with you along with your composition notebook because you're going to be able to take some notes on vocabulary as well as take some notes on the structure of the federal courts. All right, let's get started. First of all, we have a direct quote from the U.S. Constitution in Article 3, Section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. All right, so we have that one big Supreme Court, but we are much bigger than just 13 states now, so we're going to have other district and smaller courts. Um, and we'll look kind of at those maps and kind of what they do. Uh, but it's important to recognize that this also includes um, the legislative branch's um, express power of creating courts. All right? So even though the legislative branch also um, is, is assigned the duty of, of making laws, they're also able to make these lower courts. So we'll look at some of those lower courts as well as the structure of that big supreme court. Okay, here's a nice quote here from Alexander Hamilton. The judiciary has no influence over either the sword or the purse. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, merely judgment. All right, so it's not like the Supreme Court is going to make decisions about money, right? That's up to the executive and legislative branches. It's not up to um, decide consequences for breaking the law. That's up to the executive branch, okay? The Supreme Court the judicial branch is only there to judge, is only there to interpret the Constitution, to not change laws, make laws, or change the enforcement of laws directly. They are simply there to interpret those laws and make sure that they are fitting within the Constitution. So a good, good thing to keep in mind here. The Supreme Court, um, through their interpretations, uh, might change laws, right? But they're not physically changing those laws that makes any kind of sense. But as we look, through, look forward to, to learning more about the landmark cases, you'll see how the Supreme Court essentially has changed the law of the land, right? Gay marriage is legal now. Um, schools cannot be segregated. But they did that through their interpretation, not by actually writing their own laws. All right? All right, the structure of the national judiciary. This is a really important thing here to put in your notes. We, cut, we talk about cases moving up. All right, so this is about federal cases. Now, the U.S. District Court are the lowest level of federal courts created by the legislative branch. There's 94 district courts with 650 judges. These are trial courts with original jurisdiction. All right, so if you have committed a federal crime or you believe that your civil liberties or civil rights have been violated, you would often start here at the U.S. District Courts. Okay, this is separate from the state courts, which you'll read about later. Right? This, is, this is concerning federal crimes. Right? So if you've committed a federal crime, you have maybe done some drug trafficking across state lines, you've committed murders in multiple states, you've done some pretty bad stuff here to, be, to go to U.S. District Court um, in terms of where you would originally start your case. Okay? But we talk about cases moving up. Right? Because if you don't like the decision of what happens in the U.S. District Court, you have the right to appeal or to ask a higher court to hear that. And that's where we go to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, okay? Back in the day, you would go straight from the U.S. District Court to the Supreme Court, right? Our country has gotten bigger. Um, we have more judicial needs. And so Congress had to create the U.S. District Court of Appeals. All right, so it was really kind of created to lighten the load of the Supreme Court of the United States. It's 13 circuits with 170 judges, right? So there would not be uh, juries here. We would have three judge panels, and they would hear appeals, and they hear about 33,000 cases per year. So you can see, as we go up, you're going to see the U.S. District Courts hearing most of cases, the Court of Appeals hearing less cases, and now we have the Supreme Court, right, who are going to hear even less cases, okay? So... When we talk about a case moving through the courts, and you will do this because each of you is going to research a specific important Supreme Court case, they're going to start somewhere down here, right? Or they might start within the state courts, but then they're going to work their way up to the highest court of the land. 
it's going to be very rare that a case goes directly to the Supreme Court. Okay? But a case moves up. This is the path that a case would generally move on its way to the Supreme Court. All right? Now, you don't like your decision that the judge tells you in the U.S. District Court. You're not going to always be able to appeal. And we'll talk more about that. But just to give you an idea, the Supreme Court only hears about 100 cases out of the more than 5,000 requests that they have each year. All right, so they're very select in the number of cases that they're going to hear. And we'll talk a little more about like, why they, how they make that decision and what cases they decide to hear. Okay? But what I want you to know here is just those basics. This, this entire graph here should be in your notes so that you understand how to move up, the differences between how the courts get um, hear less cases. All right? But when we talk about a case moving through the courts, we talk about it starting down here, where there's going to be original jurisdiction, where a case is heard for the first time, and then moving up through its appellate jurisdiction, right? where cases are going to be heard from a lower court. All right, here is a look about what those U.S. District Courts and Court of Appeals look like, these different districts. Okay, So if you have committed a federal crime in these areas, you're going to go to District Court here. Okay, which is in Richmond. Here are some examples of the circuit courts and district courts. All right, if we notice that where is we find Virginia, down here, the fourth circuit court is in Richmond. Okay, and it would cover all of these states. So somebody in Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, or West Virginia has committed a federal crime, they need to go to the U.S. District Court, they would start here in Richmond. Okay? Now, like I said, the Supreme Court is only going to hear about 100 of those more than 5,000 cases. So how do they decide to decide? How does the Supreme Court pick a case to actually hear arguments on? Okay? Now, for one, they're not going to generally hear a case right away. It's going to have to be very controversial. It's going to have to deal with a significant constitutional issue. And it's, of course, going to have to depend on where the court has been. Uh, I'm sorry, where the case has been in the lower courts. All right, so if a case is starting off in the district court, they're gonna, the Supreme Court is going to want to make sure that that case is heard by the lower courts, the Court of Appeals, the circuit courts, the district courts, and they want to make sure that it's been heard by a lot of different judges before it's actually gotten all the way to the Supreme Court. Okay? But the Supreme Court determines its own docket, another one of our important vocabulary words. All right? The docket is the order or what the Supreme Court will hear while they're in session. Now, they can only either affirm or overturn a case. Okay, so because they have all appellate jurisdiction, the Supreme Court will only hear appeals. They will only hear cases that have also already been heard by the lower courts, right? So they can only decide that, yes, that lower court was correct and affirm it, or they can say, no, that lower court was incorrect and therefore overturn it, okay? They're not going to make a new law or change the law or strike down a portion of a law. They're only going to basically say, yes, the lower courts got it right, or no, the lower courts got it wrong and we are changing it, Okay. Now, like I said, it only accepts about 1% of cases. The clerks are very important to help um, kind of do the administrative tasks and make sure that everything gets done. We have a rule of four. So we have nine justices on the Supreme Court, for the most part, usually. All right? And at least four of them need to approve in order for the case to be heard by the, by the court. Okay. And here are our current justices. We just recently had the passing of Antonin Scalia, so he has a little no longer on the court. So actually, when I said, yeah, we have nine justices, that's usually true. Um, right now, in 2016, in this political climate, and what things, what's going on with the election, you know we've been following the story with the news. Um, after his death, there has not been a new appointment. Um, so right now, we have only eight um, judges on the Supreme Court, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Okay. All right, qualifications. Now, when we look at the other branches of government, we see tons of qualifications. You have to be 35 to be a president. You have to be 25 to be a representative in the House. You have to be um, a, a, a citizen for at least seven years, 14 years, whatever it is, whatever the office is. But when it comes to the federal courts and the Supreme Court, those judges serve a term for life under what's quote, under quote, good behavior. So all those specific qualifications that we've seen in the other branches, we do not see in the judicial branch with the Supreme Court, okay? It's basically, 
just somebody who's a good person, right? There's no age requirement, no citizenship requirement, nothing. It is up to the president, right? And this is what the controversy is now with, with choosing a, a predecessor to Antonin Scalia, okay? So we have the president under the advice and consent of the Senate. That, who, that is who chooses the federal judges, as including the Supreme Court judges, okay? But there's no other qualifications. Generally, they've been, they've had a, um, a long career as a lawyer or as a judge in the state courts or lower courts. A lot of times they may be a professor of law, those kinds of things. But there are not really specific qualifications. There's no age limit and there is no term limit. So what do you think about that? All right, now powers. The powers of the Supreme Court. Again, here are some really important vocabulary words for you to have on your vocabulary sheet. Now, these are two types of jurisdiction that the Supreme Court has. First, they have original jurisdiction, and that is authority of a court to hear a case for the first time. Okay? Original, first, jurisdiction, hear a case for the first time. Okay? So, the Supreme Court has very, very limited original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is mostly up to the U.S. district courts, the state courts, those lower level small courts, right, where, you're, where a case is going to be heard for the first time. Most of what the Supreme Court does is appellate jurisdiction, right? It does have a few times in which they have original jurisdiction. For example, if two states are, are suing each other, that, that case would go directly to the Supreme Court. But by and large, it rarely, rarely happens that a case would go all the way to the Supreme Court first before, without going to lower courts. All right, mostly what the Supreme Court has is appellate jurisdiction. And that's the authority of a court to review decisions of the trial court. All right, so like I said, in a lower court, like the US District Courts, if somebody there does not like how the judge ruled or how the jury ruled, they have the, they have the ability to appeal or to ask a higher court to rehear the case. And that's appellate jurisdiction. And right, oops, sorry. And right here, this is what the Supreme Court mostly does. Okay? They have cases based on appellate jurisdiction, things that have been, or cases that have been heard in other courts, and now they are appealing their case to the Supreme Court. Okay? We have, of course, the lower courts created by Congress. And the biggest thing that the Supreme Court does, judicial review, this is the power to declare laws unconstitutional interestingly, is not in the Constitution. Judicial review was established because the Supreme Court did it for the first time, in this case, Marbury versus Madison, back in 1803. And since they did it then, they are able to do it now all the time. Okay, so if we looked in Article 3 right now, we would not see that the Supreme Court has the power to declare laws unconstitutional. That would not be an expressed power in the Constitution that belongs to the Supreme Court. Instead, the Supreme Court has interpreted and implied that they have the right to do that, all right, because of the needs of the country and because they did it for the first time, and now they mean they can keep on doing it, okay? So in this case, Marbury versus Madison, um, the Supreme Court declared an act of Congress unconstitutional. Um, so that's where they established that power of judicial review. They did it for the first time, and now they can do it to other cases. And now we can see throughout history for the past 200 years, plus, Right? These Supreme Court judges, Supreme Court justices, um, they have declared many laws of Congress unconstitutional. Okay? Now, judicial review, a really important vocabulary word, like I said, the power to declare national, state, and local laws invalid if they violate the Constitution. Right? It's about the supremacy of federal laws. All right? So what's most important is federal law. States cannot say, nah, well, we know that the Supreme Court said that you cannot deny same-sex couples the right to marry, but here in Alabama, we really want to keep that going. Um, Kentucky, we really want to, you know, not have gay marriage. They cannot do that, okay? Even though we've seen them try to do that in recent years um, after, the, after the gay marriage decision, Okay, but this is the important part here. The Supreme Court it has final authority on the meaning of the Constitution. So there is no check on the Supreme Court. The only check on the Supreme Court is the president nominating people to the Supreme Court and the Senate confirming those nominations. So after the Supreme Court has made a decision, nobody else, no other branch of government can overturn that decision. The only people that can overturn the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court themselves. Right, so they are very, very powerful. 
Okay, judge made law. This is what I'm saying. We, uh, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what the judges say it is. And the judiciary is the safeguard of our liberty and our property under the constitution. That comes from Chief Justice Hughes, 1907. So this is a really important thing to think about in the back of our minds is even though the Supreme Court is not making laws, interpreting them is certainly affecting our daily lives, right? And it's really the importance of precedent, right? What happens before is how we need to judge what can happen later in the future. And that'll become very, very clear to you, the importance of precedent, as you start researching your case and, uh, and looking more specifically at how cases have gone through the courts and how the interpretations of these constitutional issues have really changed um, our lives as Americans and very much interpreted and changed laws. All right, how does Supreme Court decide cases? First thing, right, they have to decide to decide. Right, the SCOTUS, and by the way, SCOTUS stands for Supreme Court of the United States, they hear cases based on approval of four justices. So if four out of those nine justices say, you know what, yep, we should hear this case, then the Supreme Court will hear that case. Okay? After that, both sides of the case submit written information summarizing their point of view. All right? So if we have Bush versus Johnson in the Supreme Court, right, Johnson's lawyer will write a brief and say, this is how we view things, this is what we think is true. Bush's lawyers and side will do the same thing. This is what we think are the facts of the case. This is what we believe to be true. After that, lawyers for both Bush and Johnson will have what's called oral arguments. And this is when lawyers from each side present their oral or spoken arguments to the court. Okay, so they're able to plead their case to these nine justices. And you guys will be listening to these oral arguments as you do your research. And you will see that oftentimes the lawyers are interrupted by the justices, right? Because the justices have questions or points of clarity that they want to ask. Um, and so it's a really great way to totally, really understand a case, okay? After the oral arguments, the justices will meet in a conference to discuss the merits of a case. They're going to take a vote. They're going to say, um, yes, four of us agree that this, this case should be overturned. Five of, of us disagree, right? And they'll take a vote. Five to four, four to five, whatever it is, and the majority wins, okay? And then after the majority wins and after they, the judges decide how they're going to rule, there's going to be opinions, and we'll talk about those different types of opinions in a minute. But the justices are assigned to write the majority and minority opinions of the court, okay? When the opinion they support is determined, the decision is announced in public, and a dissenting opinion is written by justices who disagree. So really, if we were to summarize these five steps, first, they have to decide to decide. Yes, we will hear this case. Then they're going to get written information from both sides of the case. Then they're going to listen to information from both sides of the case, the reasons why this person wants the judges to rule this way. Then they're going to have a conference, and they're going to say who agrees, who disagrees. All right, That's based on a majority, whichever side is the majority wins. And then they will write opinions. And those opinions officially announce to the public what the, what the Supreme Court ruled and why. All right, more about those opinions. There are three types of opinions. And you will be um, familiar with all of these as you do your research. These are also important vocabulary words on your worksheet. The majority opinion is an official opinion of the Supreme Court and that sets out reasonings for its stances. Okay, so if at least five justices um, agree to something, right, then they will be the majority. And one of those justices will write what's called the majority opinion. And the majority opinion will say, this is what we ruled and this is why we think it's, it should be that way, right? This is why we believe this, okay? The concurrent opinion is going to be written by a judge who's also in the majority, right? One of those at least five judges. And it's going to add or emphasize a point not made before or modify a future stance. All right, the third type of opinion is called a dissenting opinion. And this is from individual justice or justices that, that disagree. They're the ones that disagree with the majority. They don't believe in the majority opinion. Um, they were one of the, the four or less who disagreed. And they're going to write an opinion as to why they disagreed, called the dissenting opinion. All right, so conclusion, the court has wide discretion over docket, all right? It, decide, it tends to side with political minorities, um, 
there's all kinds of cases that can be heard, all different types of issues that you're going to be researching. Um, what if one of those judges has a strong partisan, they, are, they strongly favor Democrats over Republicans, or they're much more liberal or conservative? Um, what are they gonna do about civil liberties? So many different issues of ethics. Um, really what I want you guys to take away is the structure of the courts, kind of how it works, because your mind is about to explode over how much court has changed society and influenced our day-to-day -day lives. So you're gonna be doing that individual research now you know all about the structure of the courts. Now you know your vocab, you have some reading to do. Really get those nuts and bolts so that you understand the basics of how the court system works because then we're gonna look at the juicy stuff. We're gonna look at those um, controversial issues. We're gonna have some great debates. We're gonna have a good time learning about landmark cases. All right, stay scholarly.